so look at this guy. He's sitting at the ball game. See, what a beautiful day in Chicago. I, I, I wish. Dave Lundy, the host of the Lundy Lunch, is coming at me green screened uh, from our home city while I'm in Arizona. The host of the Lundy Lunch. I get to finally interview. How are you? Hey, I am great. And I got to tell you, it is a beautiful day out here in the ball game. <laughs> The, I don't know the social distancing. There's 40,000 people. We're having a blast. <laughs> Man, he just put the green screen up. We're like, should we do it from a, from our office or the green? I saw that one. I said, leave that up. I just want to look at the ball game for a while. Feel normal again. We um, can all dream, man. We can all dream. <laughs> all right, we all talk about all kinds of things uh, on the Golden Me here today. Talk about the Lundy lunch. We're going to talk about Illinois and the governor and how everybody's handling this coronavirus. Um, and it's a little bit of insider politics, Dave. I, I'd say Dave's sort of my little wind-up uh, intro here. I feel like he's my uh, professional alter ego in Chicago, only a lot more successful. Uh, bachelor's degree from Washington University in St. Louis and a law degree from DePaul. I went to DePaul, not a law degree. Uh, and he also went to Northwestern for graduate work. He is on the board of the Civic Federation, president of his company, Aileron Communications, so we do some of that, have some of that in common. And he was also a journalist in his day. The, uh, let's see, the founding, founding publisher of Illinois Legal Times, wrote a business column in the Sun-Times for four years. Um, and so he's sort of like, a, I don't want to say jack of all trades because he's a master at some of this stuff. But uh, I'm really excited to get to talk to you because you're usually the host firing questions at, at, at your 50-person, 60-person Lundy lunch. Yeah, I'm not used to being on the receiving end of the questions, man. It's, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll do the best we can. Well, first of all, describe for people who, you know, it's described as, right on your, uh, uh, the hottest monthly political and media insider luncheon. So Dave has 60 folks from media and politics and all kinds of uh, public relations, all at Gene and Giorgetti's, a famous old school steakhouse that's still open, one of the few that's really still open in Chicago, and he has this private room upstairs. Tell me how that started and why you love doing it and how you go about hosting it. So um, uh, it's a great question. I, I um, a couple of uh, friends in media and I were talking one day, God, at this point, almost 17 years ago, 18 years ago. Uh, and we said, we, we got together for lunch on a Friday and we said, you know what, we should turn this into an, uh, into an everyday, you know, do, let's do this every month. Let's get a bunch of journalists together. Let's get a bunch of political types together and, and just get together. And um, uh, and uh, this was, uh, so um, Steve Edwards, um, uh, now the uh, acting CEO of WBZ, right. uh, Carlos Hernandez Gomez, the late, great Carlos Hernandez Gomez, uh, and I did this. And, um, uh, but then each of them quickly dropped off for their own reasons, although they, they both still would come back from time to time. And it just kind of became my thing. Um, and, uh, you know, in the early days, there were sometimes five people, sometimes 10, 15 people. Uh, you know, we'd get like people from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and, uh, you know, the various media folks in town and then some elected officials and candidates. And when Barack Obama ran for president, the thing just took off. Uh, because everybody wanted to, uh, uh, to, to talk politics and uh, they wanted a venue and it's all off the record. So I can't tell you what's happening there, but um, uh, you know, everybody gets together. It's very candid. Uh, uh, we have Republicans and Democrats, although you know, in fairness, we have more Democrats than Republicans. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> I, I, I try. I mean, let's not, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, the Republicans uh, are definitely outnumbered. We generally kind of have a little bit of an 80-20 split. Um, uh, but, you know, hey, I give them credit every time. You know, they're, they're willing to come and, and I try to, you know, the, the two key things about my lunch uh, that I think makes it work are, number one, I insist on civility. You want to disagree with somebody, you, you go right ahead. I have a lot of friends who are on the other side of the aisle. Um, I will argue with them intensely but it's not personal. You don't make it personal. You don't question somebody's motives. Um, you know, so, and that's hard to maintain sometimes when things get heated. Um, and then the other thing is that you just want to make sure that, that everybody gets an opportunity um, to weigh in. And so you wind up with this interesting, you know, situation where you get, you know, JB, our governor, used to be a regular at the Lundy Lunch. Uh, obviously these days he, he's not. Um, uh, but um, uh, you know, JB, Fritz Kagey, 
um, you know, uh, Sean Cast. I mean, all these these people before they were ever elected. You know, Don Harmon. Yeah. Um, Don has been a regular at the Lundy Lunch uh, for for you know 15 years. Um, and then all these people go on to do really fascinating, interesting things. And so it, it's just, it's, it's wonderfully candid. But let's pick up there with the governor. So Dave is a, a long time aide in several positions. Oh, I didn't say that in the intro. He also used to, he also used to run campaigns. So we have that in common. It's just, uh, it's, it's amazing once uh, we get to know each other a little bit the last few years, how much we have in common. Of course, uh, my guy didn't get to be governor of Illinois, uh, much less mayor of Chicago um, at, at, with two tries on Gary Chico. So congratulations on that. I remember when you announced it at the Lundy lunch that, you know, on a personal level, we just swore in our governor. Wow. Uh, so let's talk about that with the news with coronavirus. I mean, I've heard, I've heard across the board, Dave, different, different stuff from one spectrum to the other where he has handled this like a genius. He's been out front, he has taken on Trump, but he's also gotten the resources. And I was just wa uh, reading some social media comments this morning from people in Chicago, uh, granted, uh, uh, right of center or further right, uh, ripping the governor. Um, tell me, I, I, I know it's probably hard for you to be objective, but, but talk about how you think, uh, especially in comparison to other governors, how, how Pritzker's handled this so far. Look, I, I think that the thing that people need to understand about JB is uh, he is going to be guided by the science. He's not interested in the politics of this. He's interested in the science. He's interested in getting people back to work. Um, I, you know, his, I think he's done a very good job of communicating regularly with folks. Uh, you know, he's a guy, you know, I've known him for 30 years. This is a guy who doesn't get angry. Um, I have seen him angrier about the federal response uh, during the coronavirus than I've ever seen him in 30 years. And that, that doesn't mean we haven't, you know, there haven't been tense moments. So my firm represented his business interests for about 20 years um, until he started running for governor. Actually, we still represent some of them, um, although he's not involved, of course. Um, I, I think he's done a great job. You're right, I am biased. Um, but I know that, you know, look, Whatever you want to say about the president, um, and there are a lot we, we probably will say in the next uh, few minutes, um, he has made it crystal clear that politics are a driving force in how he wants to be perceived on this, on this uh, pandemic response. Um, that is the last thing on JB's mind. It is the last thing he is focused on. And it should be the last thing on any elected official's mind. This is not about politics. This is bigger than politics. And so when you make everything about politics, um, you're not doing the first and foremost thing, which is do what's best for the people. Uh, and so I, I really think he's, uh, you know, that has been his driving force. That has been his focus. And, you know, he, he and I have talked about this a lot. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I remember the first time he talked about his interaction with the federal government um, back in January. And he was just... Uh, Let's let's just say, uh, and I don't want to you know reveal what the specific things he said in our conversation. Let's just say there was frustration from early on with whether the federal government took this in the in the serious manner that they should. You know, look, we're 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 recording this uh, on a Friday going into a weekend, uh, and you know, there's obviously you follow the news like I do. I probably watch it too much. There's just there's a ton of chatter, you know, about what what we're doing going forward, how this is going to return to normal, if normal is even possible. I don't want to go over all that, but there is there is a question that's directly before us, right? As it's April, I think, 11th, a good Friday. There's a few weeks till the stay in place nationally, the guidelines at least, are, are over. And now we're seeing, uh, um, we're seeing some of this move in a positive direction, but people can get way out ahead of that way too quick. And I haven't heard a good answer yet from the medical experts themselves about how testing gets broad enough, even in, even in a single state, to not risk having this whole thing happen again. This happened in, the, in, in 1918. Some of those cities got out there early, too early, and then an outbreak happened. Do you, do yeah. you have any thoughts on this? Any, you know? Insight? Look, I, I was listening to a guy from Harvard this morning um, address this precise issue, because every time I hear one of my, one of my right-wing friends saying, oh, JB's screwing this up, you gotta reopen the economy, this is an overreaction, et cetera, I'm like, okay, let's play that out for us for one second. 
you reopen the economy and we have a nice time for two, three weeks, we get back to normal, and then all of a sudden, a ton of people get sick again. I, I don't get it. Yeah. The hospitals, and a bunch of people die, and more people die in the second wave than died in the first wave. That is not an answer. And this was the point that the guy from Harvard was making this morning. He's like, look, you, what you want to be able to do is you want to reopen this once. You want to close it once and reopen it once. And the only way to do that is with massive widespread testing. You're going to have to be tested um, multiple times. It's not just a matter of testing everybody once. You want to go, you really want to go into uh, a Cubs game, you know, with all my friends here and, oh, wait, I'm disappearing. Um, <laughs> you want to go back to Wrigley Field and not know that the person sitting to your right, left, in front, and behind you are clear? Really? I mean, there was a poll that was done I saw yesterday that said 75% of the public would not go to a sporting, a large sporting event unless they, there was a vaccine. And think about that for one second. That's a scary thought. Because what that tells you is that this is not a, hey, we'll be back in June. This tells you we'll be back to normal sometime in 2021. Um, and as somebody who's got a couple of kids who, you know, are thinking about what they're going to do for camp, you're not going to have normal camp. You're not going to have normal summer camp. You know, the, the governor yesterday in, in his, at the end of his press conference you know, made a little news when he said, um, when he said uh, that, uh, well, if I were, he was asked a question about, uh, what would you tell people who are planning large summer festivals? And he said, well, I, I would seriously consider whether you can hold those large summer festivals. Um, and look, a lot of these things are statements of the obvious, but they're apparently not obvious to some of our friends who are using a political prism rather than a health prism. Yeah, you know, the thing is, I mean, I, I, I have to say, look, this, this is a tough, this is incredibly difficult. There are no easy answers to this. And so that's, an, that's the next question I want to ask you. Um, be, because you, you have written about business, you own a business, you deal with business people like I do uh, uh, every day, probably more than I do in Chicago. Um, and, and there's this balance. I don't blame the president for wanting to open up the country. Political, who, who, who doesn't want to open up the country? But, and, and so the question is, because I talked to somebody else the other day, Dave, and, and they were president of a huge company for, for a decade, huge uh, a hedge fund uh, in New York. And he was sort of saying, you know, the, the kind of damage that this can do to the whole country if it's prolonged can outweigh there, there's just no good answer. How do you, how do, how do they find the balance? How, I mean, I guess these are, these are unknowns. These are just unknowns, but in Chicago, in Chicago, I would say you're looking at the business community. What's the feel there? Cause I'm not even there right now. Yeah, no, the, the, um, uh, the, the look, it's bad. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, my, my business right now is fine. Um, I, uh, and you know, knock on, knock on wood, but, um, I, you know, I, I'm not worried about what's going to happen in the next two, three, four months. I'm worried about what's going to happen in months four through 12. Um, because the way I see this unfolding is that the economic carnage is, is incalculable at this point, And it, it has the, the disruption is going to be massive. Um, but again, the question is, yeah, it sucks. Yeah. You want to complain about it. I'm with you. I'll complain just as loudly as you will. But I don't have a magic wand. Yeah. You know, nobody here is a god. Nobody here has the ability to just suddenly go, okay, status quo ante. Let's just, let's just revert to the way it was. I love to revert to the way it was. You think I like sitting here in my home, uh, sorry, at Wrigley Field. No, in my home <laughs> office, um, you know, working every day from home instead of from my office. And my kids are stuck inside and they're going crazy. Um, and, you know, my wife is, is you know, cooking all the food and um, yes, we're occasionally doing carry out, but um, you know, nobody's particularly comfortable with that. Uh, I mean, th this is not the way we want to live, but you either make the tough calls now and you do this right. And then eventually you get back to it or you don't. And the problem I have with my friends on the right who are and the president um, uh, is they're not accepting reality. 
Um, if you were really focused on how do we get back to business as quickly as humanly possible, what your primary focus would be, what the number one focus you would have from January yeah, is right. testing, testing, That's testing, right, testing. Right. No, there's there's no question. And, and and you know, I mean, it's identification, isolation, and then contact tracing. And I'll tell you, even in even in China, where they were supposedly doing all this, and it was they haven't they haven't figured out that whole game on the, on the contact tracing. That is a complex thing to do. They're trying to use technology now uh, in a new way to actually burrow further down on that and get specific. All right, let's switch gears for a second because I want to make sure I use the time uh, 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 wisely here. I don't want to talk just about coronavirus, especially because you're a fellow uh, Politico. I, I, I like to ask a, a couple questions. Um, and you're the perfect perfect guy for this. The, fir the first thing is, all your years working for politicians and with politicians, what's something about them, an observation about them, that you think most people aren't aware of, don't know about politicians? Oh, gosh. Um, well, the thing is, <laughs> I've worked with a lot, as you have. And you know, there's no one, there's no one commonality um, because it takes all kinds. You know, you've got the politicians that are doing it because they're mission driven. Um, you know, what one thing I will say about about JB, um, uh, and I know this you know, because I've known him so well, um, he's mission driven. He didn't run for governor for you know the self-aggrandizement or to have a better lifestyle. Trust me, his lifestyle was way better um, before. He ran because he wanted to accomplish things. He wanted to do things. So I think most politicians, most, um, want to get something done. Um, and you know, there's no point in running just to say, "Hey, I've got the title." Although you and I both know a lot of people who are yeah. precisely that yeah. way. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's um, uh, you know it's, it's sometimes mind-boggling. I, I I worked with a guy once who. Uh, uh, you know, who was who said, I want to, I want to run. I'm like, okay, well, what, what do you want to do? Um, and it's like, well, I, I, I want to become this office. I'll, I'm going to leave, leave him anonymous for the moment. Um, I, and I said, and, and, and as the campaign wore on, um, he, he got a little frustrated because he said, look, I want to be a thought leader on this. I said, great, tell me your thoughts. And he didn't have any. And he wanted me to come up with some thoughts of what are the creative things that he wants to do. I'm like, look, you're running for this office for a reason. What is it you want to get done? Just tell me what you want to get done. I'll turn that into messaging and we'll make that, in, you know, that'll be part of the campaign. We'll do some polling, figure out what's going to work. Um, but if people want to be thought leaders, they have to have thoughts. <laughs> and so sometimes it is, um, uh, it is uh, 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 challenging to work with candidates who just want to get the title because they want the title. You know, I, I think, look, politicians get a rough rap, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> and, you know, in some ways, rightfully so. I mean, it's, it's a public position. And in some ways, it's not that different from leading other organizations, except it all plays out publicly, and the whole public's got to rehire you, right? Um, but the hardball of politics, talk about that for a minute, where, where it you, you have to sometimes make compromises. You have to make do, do things sometimes that you don't want to do for the bigger picture. And, and not everybody is aware of that or appreciates that in the moment. I, I, I'm, I'm asking. That, that's what I've found. Yeah, you know, uh, and again, the better, the better people don't necessarily make the best politicians. And, and when I, I want to be careful how I say that. Um, not everybody is willing to sacrifice for the greater good. Uh, this is true in politics, it's true in life. Um, you know, I think about, uh, the story I always think about when I think about politicians is, um, and, and forgive me, I'm showing my age here, 1993. Um, <laughs> Bill Clinton is the new president. He's trying to get his budget passed through Congress. His budget required tax increases. Now, prior to Bill Clinton, nobody had been successful by calling for tax increases and running for office. Walter Mondale famously in 1984 says, I'm gonna raise your taxes, Ronald Reagan's gonna raise your taxes, I'm just the one who's gonna be honest with you. And he lost 49 states. So not real good in our business to do that. But so 1993, um, the, the, the Clinton budget is being debated on the House floor. Um, 
and the the vote is tied and they can't break the tie and they hold the vote open you know it's, it's also vote for 15 minutes as you know mr unlock congress um and they hold the vote open for like two three hours and eventually marjorie margulies mazvinsky <laughs> casts the tie-breaking vote um and as she gets up there and gives her speech on the house floor the Republicans start shouting, Marjorie, Marjorie, because she represented the uh, a Philadelphia suburb and a suburb that frankly didn't normally represent, didn't elect Democrats. And so they knew that this vote meant she was going to be a one-term congressman. Right, right. But the greater good, she was willing to sacrifice herself and get the Clinton budget passed. And it was, of course, successful. Um, and of course, the, I, I, I would be remiss um, to not add the fact that Marjorie Margulies Mazvinsky wound up becoming in-laws because her son wound up marrying Chelsea Clinton. I, 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 I couldn't remember the name of the person. I knew who you were telling that story about, though. And, and, and I don't even know if that's called irony. It's something in that, in that ballpark. Uh, uh, but that's a, or a wild coincidence. But um, that's a great, I'm so glad you brought that up, that vote, because it reminds me uh, uh, at the time, uh, um, of Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act at the time, when it was actually, and the Patient Protection Act, when it was up for a vote, I had people calling me, even though I, I was done running campaigns, but they knew that I knew Congresswoman Bean, Melissa Bean in the 8th District, who was a, uh, a, a, a Democrat, um, and, and she, she was in a conservative district. So she had stolen this thing right from Phil Crane, who was in there for 35 years. And people were calling me saying, you, you should call Melissa Bean and tell her to vote for the Affordable Care Act. I said, believe me, she knows you want to, she knows you, all you Democrats want to vote for the Affordable Care Act. She's, but if she does that, she and dozens of others are very possibly or likely, depending on the district, to lose their seat. And by the way, she did lose her seat to, yeah. to Bill Walsh uh, by 391 votes. Funny thing, right. she, she called me four weeks before that election and said, you got to come out here. The whole thing's screwed up. We're going to lose. And I said, I, you're up six points in the polls. And I can't, anything that's wrong, I'm not going to be able to fix. But, it, but that vote, that vote was huge in a lot of those people losing. So it's a perfect example uh, of what you're talking about. Tell me, wh why, do you still, why do you still love politics after all these years? Why, how, how are you not burned out on it? And Because I can tell when you host that luncheon. You, you have a ball, you love batting it around, you love asking the questions, you love people getting engaged in it. You can't, you can't hide that love for it. You know, uh, that's true, but okay. True confession, just between you and me, <laughs> th there are months I don't want to do the lunch. There are months that I get, I, I feel like, oh, I just am not in the mood for it. Um, this is, and this, this is breaking. Sorry, this is breaking news. This is no, like this I, could be the headline. Uh. Oh, I, 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 you know, and it's. <laughs> it, I mean, the, because you know what? I, I'm human. I get burned out on it. it. It's it's very frustrating. And and really, what I get burned out on, um, and I've been very frustrated in this coronavirus thing, because you know what I find so often is that some folks on the sorry, I'm just going to say it. Some folks on the right. Um, they think because they're posturing that you're posturing. Right. And I'm not, I'm not posturing. I don't posture. I tell you what I believe. You know, um, I used to, uh, when I go on to uh, uh, do uh, you know, talking head stuff like you do, um, I, you know, one of the reasons some people like to have me on is that I'm just going to tell you my opinion. And back when Barack Obama was president, um, when he was dithering on ISIS um, and when he was dithering on Syria, I, I gave him hell for dithering on Syria because I'm going to give you my opinion. You know, I, I, I'll tell you a funny story. I was on the air with, uh, with a, a, a friend on the right. Um, we were doing a show one day, and, and again, I'm going to leave his name off. Uh, but yes, it's a he. Um, and he was saying all this crazy stuff. This was in the early Trump era. And he was trying to wrestle which way to go on, on the Trump thing. And, and, and at one point, he decided to just go full Trump. Um, and he starts telling me like, oh my God, Tr Trump's going to get a clean up. He's going to win 40 states. He's just blah, blah, blah. And he starts lathering on and on and on. And we get off the air and I turn to him and I said, you don't believe all that stuff you just said, do you? He said, well, some of it. I'm like, 
Some of it? What are you talking about? I'm not, go I say things I believe. I, 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 I agree I, with you. I, I, I agree with you. In fairness, in fairness to some uh, uh, of my friends on the right and your friends on the right, some of them do too. It's, you can't, you know, generalize all that. And some, some in Chicago, especially some of our friends uh, uh, that host programs, they are brutally honest. And you know, that's one of the things in politics. If you're, if you're, if you're an idealist or a partisan on one side or the other, sometimes you're listening to the other side. Democrats and Republicans do this. And you're, well, you know, I'm watching Laura Ingram and I'm like, does she really believe this? Or is this just to jack up her audience? But they think the same thing about the people that are left of center. And if, you know, if, but most of, most people don't get out of their shoes, out of their heads for a minute and look at it from the other side. How, how could they really believe this? Well, they have a different opinion and they really believe it. But but you look at a guy like Joe Walsh. Let's take Joe Walsh for example. Nah, I'm not yeah, right. I'm not talking about him. Right, go on. But but you know, Joe Walsh postured the hell out of everything. And right. then all of a sudden now suddenly he's the paragon of virtue, talking about how, how evil Donald Trump is because he's I'm like, dude, you were the king of this crap. So so you know, um, uh, I, I don't get burned out on politics. I get burned out on on disingenuousness. I get burned out on dishonesty. I get burned out on the notion that we are not doing this um, uh, for the right reasons. That we are doing this uh, just to try to make a political point. And I hate when I see people do that on the left, and I hate people who do that on the right. Um, I, I have never gone on a, 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 of the hundreds of, of shows I've done over over time. I have never gone on a show and had somebody send me their talking points and I'm just reading their talking points. That just ain't how I roll. And, and I'm not trying to be holier than thou. I'm, I'm sure you're like this too. I just, I just don't get that. I don't believe in that. Well, and yet, part, part, I, think, I, think, I think part of that comes from a, a, a background of straight journalism. Right, we've seen the other side of it. If you if you if you've done that in journalism, so you don't want to get fed something and regurgitate it. You know what I'm saying? There are some people who are just political operatives from the get go and don't have that 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 sort of background. Although uh, in fact, I was a columnist, I was not a journalist. Okay. I always draw distinction. I mean, that's <laughs> I, true. That's true. I, I did a a, a a for four years. I did a, a column on business technology in, in Chicago for the Sun Times. Um, but, uh, and I also did, I hosted my own radio program and some other stuff too, but, um, but I just, I always, I have enough respect for my journalist friends not to pretend to be one of them. Yeah, well, no, no, I, I get it. And actually I make that distinction now and, you know, uh, uh, I, I was, I, you know, just, just the word journalist. And now if you ask me or on my website, it's opinion journalist. It's not the same thing. <laughs> You know, opinion journalists, if hopefully if you're a good one, you're going to marshal facts and you're going to explain things in a way that lend credibility to your the argument you're prosecuting and not just be popping off. Uh, and, and, and Michael, that, that, is the, that is the thing that is most depressing about how, thing is, how politics have changed over the last couple of decades. It's the death of facts. Um, it, it's the, because uh, I'm a data guy. I've always been a data guy. I'm a data guy whether I'm working for clients or I'm a data guy whether I'm in politics. Um, data drives me. So I'm gonna give you a fact-based argument. I'm not gonna give you an argument that's purely about emotion, um, whereas some other politicians are all about the emotion. And unfortunately, there's a certain uh, a news network out there um, that is not focused on facts. And they, you know, there, there've been studies done that have shown that people who spend all their time watching Fox are infinitely less well informed. That's I'll tell you what, you know what? I, when you just said study, I, I I'm gonna go look. I wonder if there's a study that's just just studied. If you took MSNBC and, and Fox News, which are the are polar opposites, some people yeah. who group CNN in the same exact bucket as MSNBC, and I, I'd say they're getting closer. But but the, you know that MSNBC and Fox are, are two alternate universes. In fact, I was talking with someone uh, last week on, on this program about that, Brian Rosenwald, who who just wrote a book about talk radio and the Republicans and 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 how that whole thing developed with Limbaugh. But it would be interesting to see a, a, a study that's been done on just verifying the degree, amount of fact on each network. That would be really interesting to see if it's the most objective source you could find. 
Except, of course, nobody would agree on the object what the word objective means. Well, right, but that's that's the thing. You can only do what you can do. You can only get as good an arbiter as as somebody's faith in the arbiter, I suppose. But but. Right. And by and by the way, I, you know, I would I would argue that this is the biggest difference between the opinion folks on Fox and the opinion folks on MSNBC. Um, the opinion folks on MSNBC uh, consistently cite facts. They're always now they may be cherry picked facts. But they're always citing facts and data. Anybody who want want, wants to compare Rachel Maddow and, and Sean Hannity, um, uh, you know, if you watch Rachel Maddow, everything is driven by data. Um, it's one of the reasons I like Rachel. Um, well, where Hannity just makes up his own facts. Yeah, no, look, if, if, if I was about to say, uh, Rachel Maddow, I, I, I don't watch her regularly, but she is, I'd say she's the most fact-based and she's the, she's the, she's the, she's, the, she's most responsible about that. There are, I mean, Chris Matthews has only been gone a little while, but you know, he was a shouter. There was not a lot of marshalling. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just, so but, it's sort of like, but yes, I, but, but I think that overall that's true. I'd like to test the theory and see if I'm right, uh, uh, see if there was a, a way to do an objective analysis. Um, all right, last question, my friend. So as we do this, I got stranded out here gladly, no complaints in uh, in Phoenix. So uh, I haven't been to my hometown Chicago in six, seven weeks. And, uh, you know, I, and I'm missing it a little bit now. It's starting to creep in there. So last question, you know, you, you, you are a Chicagoan to the core. What do you love about the city? What do you love about Chicago? And in in the same question or part B, what do you think most distinguishes Chicago from other great cities in the country? Well, I mean, I think this is this is less about Chicago and more about the Midwest. I, I think Midwest people are the, the, the Yiddish expression; they, they tend to be more Hamish. Um, they're, they're they're a little bit more they're a little bit more real, um, uh, and. Uh, people who are traveling to Chicago, um, that they're shocked when, if they're standing there on the corner and they're looking at their map, somebody always stops to help. Totally. All, happens all the time. I do it myself. I always, if I see somebody standing and they look lost, I always try to help. Um, I'm not sure that happens in, in a lot of other cities. Um, I, I, you know, you get into a city that, that, that's, um, okay, I'll just say it, New York. Um, uh, and, uh, people are, uh, are, are less willing to do that. Different. Um, it's different. It is. It's different. So, I mean, look, I, I love Chicago. Um, you know, I grew up in the burbs. I lived in the city for 26 years. Um, I would still be in the city today. Um, I married a native New Yorker, ironically, who was born and raised in a high rise. Um, so she thought we were in the burbs when we were living in Lincoln square, um, <laughs> cause there was grass and no doorman. Um, but um, I, I'd still be living in the city, but for the fact I, I had a kid who wound up with a, uh, who has a, a life-threatening peanut allergy. And at the time, CPS was not good um, about that kind of thing. They're better now, but they weren't good then. Um, and uh, the private school we went to was good with, with, uh, was good with uh, a peanut, not good with school. Um, and so we wound up uh, having to move back out to the burbs. Um, but uh but I, I still, I love Chicago, love Chicago. And I miss being downtown, even though I'm, I'm here, I'm working from home, I, I miss being downtown. I still go down once a week to, you know, cause I run a business to your point, I need to check the mail and get the checks and get the bills. And, you know, we still gotta, we still gotta pay people. They're not, nobody's, nobody's reaching out to me going like, hey Dave, yeah, don't worry about those bills. Hey, you've got Corona, it's fine. My landlord still wants to be paid, go figure. Uh, you know what? I got to get my mail sent to me. I'm scared to see what's in it. You know, I mean, except for the checks that I'm, you know, waiting to come in. I'm scared to see on the other end what's in it. Uh, and I got a friend of mine, I think is going to do that for me this week. God bless him. But, uh, but, uh, well, listen, I, I, I think I told you that I, I've been doing this as an audio podcast for qu quite some time and I've only recently started doing it via video. So if the uh, audio levels are a little jacked in the beginning or there's another glitch, you'll have to forgive me, but you also got to promise me uh, if I'm still doing it uh, uh, and built it up in a year to come back uh, when, when we're, you know, either in the same place or, or you won't need a green screen. Look forward to seeing you in person. And hey, maybe, you know what, maybe you can join me here at uh, Wrigley Field. <laughs> I'll tell you, I, 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 
it's put me in a good mood. Just see that. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's the combination. But just seeing that behind you, it's put me in a good mood. Uh, it, it's this is a really this is a really tricky time. I think a good part is that people have connected more with each other in different ways uh, uh, in some new ways than we have in a long time or not at all. I've heard story after story from friends uh, over the phone about that. And even the New York governor was talking about it. He, he, he talked about how him and his daughter talked about stuff they never had before. He on a public stage with her sitting right next to him. I thought it was extraordinary. Like, actually, that'll be the last question. Now, because you're, you're more insulated with your family, what's that been like? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, um, uh, it, you are forced into a level of intimacy, um, you know, because everybody in their daily lives, they all have routines, right? Uh, we all, we go about our routines and go to work, go to the gym, go on your bike rides, whatever. Um, and the kids have their routines. You take them to 27 different, uh, you know, uh, activities, sporting, whatever. Um, and now we all have each other. And, and there's a forced intimacy uh, that I think in many respects, here's the thing. For those who have good relationships, it's a good thing. Right. For those that have troubled relationships, it's a very bad thing. Uh, the incidents of domestic violence have you know, gone through the roof. Um, so from my perspective, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, you know a couple of days ago uh, at the Seder, we were talking about this. Um, you know, because it's all about a fight for perspective. Um, you want to keep this in perspective. Uh, you know, nobody's asking me to, to storm a beach. Nobody's asking me to fight in a jungle. Um, uh, you know, we're, unlike our ancestors, we're not living through a pogrom. We're living through, you know, the Holocaust. Um, we're being asked to, you know, spend more time with the people we love um, and try in the process to not kill each other and let the plague pass over our houses. I think we got this. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. It's driving me that you know, once in a while you hear yourself complaining or even in your head about it, and you're like, you know what? D relax. If this is, is the, if this is the most this country has to finally come together to do this, that is not a sacrifice. I mean, it is it is for the people who are economically hurting, and that is a yep. whole other question. But I'm talking about just the time, just the time and missing that connection with people. It sucks. We'll survive, right? Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I absolutely think so. And, um, uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, what I'm hoping, you know, if, if you want to look at hope for the future, um, uh, you know, America had, had become a, a, a very frivolous country. Um, you know, we've spent, uh, how many people uh, can name uh, every reality star and can't name a single Supreme Court justice? Um, you know, we've really gotten away from things that matter and i guess my hope one of my hopes for this situation obviously i hope that the fewest number of people die and the fewest number of people get sick and we get out of this as quickly as possible but i hope we become a little bit more real as a country um recognizing that you know you know why politics matters not because of the politics but because what the people do who we elect and the quality of the people we elect and how they handle situations like this one it matters and if we didn't understand that before, you better understand it now. That is, that is, I, that is, that's where we're going to stop. Except for one observation I'll add that when I used to give talks about Unlock Congress or even teaching, you know, I'd say, look, they get a bad rap and I get sick of them too, politicians sometimes, but they make the rules. You can, you can not vote if you want. You can have no opinion or not get engaged at all. But however many, much tax you pay, where you get to park, how good your schools are, every single thing is impacted in some degree by, by, by public decision makers, in other words, elected officials. Dave Lundy, president of Aileron Communications, um, host of the, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, the, not eminent. Uh, I illustrious, that's what I'm looking for, illustrious Lundy Lunch, uh, a monthly in Chicago that I, I'm fortunate to have, have been a part of, uh, and I, I'm overdue for an appearance there when the world gets back to normal. Thanks for a ton of doing this. I really appreciate it, Dave. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for watching, everybody. Talk to you all soon on The Golden Beat.